A reading from Philippians. My brothers and sisters whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge you, Odia, and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. Well, hey, everybody, we continue our message series called Joy Incorporated. My experience as a new Christian, as a young adult years ago, came with lots of surprises and lots of contrasts in terms of the life I left behind, some of which were external lifestyle patterns, others or internal patterns, matters of the heart and mind. Some of these changes were perhaps immediate and others seemed like they were more gradual. For instance, learning to pray. I remember thinking uh, that as a new Christian, prayer was uh, something new for me, but I felt so inadequate about it. I struggled for words to express gratitude or how to even ask God about the things that weighed heavy on my heart, and, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, A kind minister from my hometown sent me a booklet on prayer, which is really helpful. My college roommate, a much more mature follower of Jesus, prayed with me and for me often. Unbeknownst to him, he was setting for me an example to follow, along with other leaders, pastors, campus ministers, friends, in whose orbit I was now a part of in this new family I was discovering, this body of Christ, this thing we call the church. Well, what was I experiencing? What was God doing in my life? How was I being shaped and nurtured as a new follower of Jesus? And in particular, how was my participation in Christian community shaping my new life in Christ? These are good questions, not only for new Christians, but for all followers of Jesus at all times. Paul's words in Philippians 4, 1 through 9, capture a little bit of how the gospel of Christ shapes us and the implications of the gospel and how that shape helps us to bear witness in the world. For Paul, everything was coming under the shape of the gospel. Jesus in the center. Paul's words to the Philippians in chapter 4 reveal an exhortation toward a gospel practice among his people and in the world. That is how the centrality of faith in Jesus gives birth to a new way of spirit-filled living. The good news of Jesus is that Not only does he rescue us, forgive us and grace us, he calls us to follow. We follow Jesus into entire new realities as part of new creation. And of course, this comes with transformational changes in our own lives. How could it not? We could never follow Jesus and remain unchanged. This is the journey of the Christian life, walking with Jesus, who is Lord of all. Trusting and obeying, learning from him and allowing his work in us to have its way. This is what Uh, scripture and theology describes as sanctification, which can feel very uneven as we go along. Sanctification or discipleship has been described as the feeling of walking down uh, or walking up a down escalator. Are we making progress? Sometimes it's hard to tell. Of course, we have to be careful about how we judge that change or that progress in ourselves and in others. We're easily deceived, we're easily discouraged, and we're also easily impressed Sometimes we get caught up spending too much time uh, color commentating or critiquing someone else's journey up the down escalator, which is not to say that we shouldn't have concern for one another or even hold each other accountable uh, in community. But too often we miss the point, which is to build one another up in love so that Jesus is exalted, so that the world may know him and see him for who he is. In the Christian life, 
Jesus is the center and the gospel becomes the indelible mark, a cultural stamp of the Holy Spirit, if you will, that guides our journey. In Philippians 4, Paul begins to prescribe gospel application for the church in Philippi in the form of what I would call three key values. These three values are practices emerge from the gospel hope that we have. Paul begins to show how the joy of the gospel pulls us into the orbit of these values and shapes us. These values are community, prayer, and perspective. The great theologian Karl Barth once wrote, joy in Philippians is a defiant nevertheless, close quote. These three values in the gospel are not easy to maintain. It takes the defiant nevertheless from the Holy Spirit to persevere in these areas. And as we do, our lives are enriched and others are blessed along the way. In Philippians 4, 1 through 9, Paul gives us three distinctive areas of gospel applications. Their implications, prevailing community, prevailing prayer, and prevailing perspective. In verses 1 through 3, Paul says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Yodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life, close quote. Paul calls the Philippians to strive for one mind and to be in one accord in Christ, to stand firm together in the Lord, to agree in the Lord. We don't know what conflict there was that existed between Yodia and Syntyche, uh, well, what would, it was about, but Paul was confident that they could reconcile through the gospel hope that they both shared. These women were vital servant leaders in the church. Shared gospel hope means that you and I are family in Christ. We have worked side by side in ministry. We belong to Jesus. Our names have been written in the book of life, which means that the grace of reconciliation uh, is stronger than any rift or jealousy or envy or hardship. We may have divergent styles or approaches or personalities. Uh, unity doesn't mean uniformity, but we can all seek unity through the grace of Christ. We can agree in the Lord. Gospel joy is the hope of persevering community. Paul goes on to say in Philippians 4 verse 3, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Close quote. We can't always rejoice in our circumstances for what they are, but we can always rejoice in the Lord of all circumstance. He is ever worthy in spite of hardship and trial. God is working all things for our good and for his glory. Even in our disagreements with others, especially in the church, it's vital that we first remember that we serve Jesus Christ together, that we belong to Christ together, and that we exist to glorify Christ together and to remember that the person I'm in conflict with or in disagreement with is a fellow member of the body of Christ and precious in the sight of the Lord. It changes our perspective on that. So Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. And then this curious phrase, let your reasonableness be known to all for the Lord is near. Reasonableness in the Greek is epiakes, which means gentle forbearing, the same patient forbearing that Jesus demonstrated to you we demonstrate to others both inside and outside the church. This may be one of the more stunning qualities of Christian witness in the world and probably one that we need to remember the most. Our ability, that is, to be gentle with others. It goes hand in hand with the joy of the gospel. Paul himself demonstrates his patient love toward the believers in Philippi, exhorting them to work through their differences with patience and with reasonableness. The fact that Paul waits until this far into his letter to mention the divide uh, or the, the unrest that existed between Euodia and Syntyche shows his patience and his measured perspective about it. This quality is especially helpful for us parents. The urge to discipline and correct our children at, mo at a moment's notice often exposes our extreme impatience and our lack of gentle forbearance that might serve our children better in the long run, rather than flying off the handle in a reactionary kind of way. Guilty as charged. The attractiveness of Jesus is the fullness of grace and truth. Here is the Lord who reigns and he is full of mercy. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Why? How? 
Paul says, because the Lord is near. The second mark of gospel joy is prevailing prayer. Paul says in verse 5, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Close quote. The prevalence, or the prevalence, I should say, of anxiety in our current culture is absolutely mind-boggling to consider. The challenge, nuance, freedom, mobility, options, and what the philosopher Charles Taylor calls the Nova effect, which is his description of a pluralistic smorgasbord of worldview choices in our modern world, in which people, young people especially, feel increasingly cross-pressured and confused about what to believe and why to believe it. Is it real? Uh, it is a real challenge, that's for sure. Add to that the further erosion of family structure as a basis for security, predictability, and normative routine, and a sense of institutional failure all around us. It's no wonder we're battling anxiety like never before. While I certainly acknowledge the therapeutic value of counseling uh, and forms of medicinal treatment uh, as legitimate for sure, there's no greater prescription, I think, uh, for battling anxiety than the one given to us by Paul in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Don't be anxious about anything, Paul says, but in everything, prayer. In the Alpha Course, we learn a simple and great formulary for the kind of prayer that Paul is describing. Three words to remember, thanks, sorry, and please. We praise and thank the Lord for who He is. We confess our lives before Him, being honest and real, asking for forgiveness and renewal. And then we ask, please, for our own needs and for the needs of others. Thanks, sorry, please. It can be a help when we don't know how to begin in prayer. When we bring ourselves before God in prayer, we give Him our burdens, we listen for His counsel, and we remember His loving kindness and His steadfast authority. No wonder that prayer is the antidote to anxiety. There's a reason, if you think about it, it feels helpful to us, and we feel better when we talk to someone about our burdens a friend or a spouse or whoever. And when we learn to talk to God, we're strengthened as well. When Paul says that the peace of God will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, we dare not miss the irony uh, that he was under the watch of the Roman imperial guard charged with keeping the peace of the Roman Empire. But only Jesus, Paul intimates, can truly guard us, give us a peace that endures to eternal life. Lastly, Paul exhorts us in verses 8 and 9 with these words, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Close quote. These virtues listed by Paul were common virtues of classic Greek philosophy and ethics, widely known and celebrated for their moralistic high bar. But what Paul seems to be advocating uh, for here is for the Philippian church to be active in celebrating God's truth and beauty and learning to recognize wherever it may show up, wherever it may uh, emerge, even outside the walls of distinct Christian fellowship. This is a missiological value of great importance. It means that all truth and beauty and justice and loveliness and excellence is from God and belong to God. In a world where Christians are known more for what they're against than for what they're for, here Paul is suggesting that the joy of the gospel even helps us relate to the praiseworthy aspects of culture that may yet to recognize where beauty, truth, and excellence ultimately come from and what it reflects, which is ultimately the glory of God. As followers of Jesus, then, we can celebrate with others, no matter who they are, the praiseworthy virtues of common culture, which gives the church reasons to celebrate with an unbelieving world in all kinds of ways. When we find that common ground, we build relationships 
and we build trust and that in turn in turn builds credibility we open our lives to get to know our neighbors and listen and when the moment's right when god opens the door we get to share our joy in jesus with others no greater privilege no greater joy it's prevailing community it's prevailing prayer it's a prevailing perspective all through the gospel all through the joy of the gospel that belongs to us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thanks be to God.